welcome. And we're very lucky and fortunate today to have Lynn Ferris with us to do a demonstration of her award-winning watercolor technique. Um, I think that you all will really enjoy watching her. She has, you know, awards and accreditations from here to eternity. <laughs> She's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> we have a wonderful uh, exhibit of endangered species, animals and uh, plant life. Our, our membership and others met the challenge and, uh, <laughs> and it's a beautiful show and I'm very proud of it. So do catch it before you do. But now I'm going to turn it over to Okay, Lynn. okay. Well, welcome. Um, yes, I'm Lynn Ferris, and I'm going to paint pictures for you. <laughs> My love of watercolor is largely based on how light works, because light is the thing that just, it brings the emotion, and it lets it pop, and it just goes, <gasps> so, um, you know, there's so many ways to work with light and watercolor and I'm just going to touch on one of them today which is how light would work on a rounded form and how it will bounce color into the shadow areas. So I chose birds, um, the old Florida pigeons, I ibis. So if you can see the little picture I started with here, I, I did want to make a couple of mentions is I never work literally from my photograph. It's a jumping off point. And especially something like this, where I was looking out the window at these guys and I couldn't say like, you know, Fred, move over six inches. So I, when I drew it, 
I took some liberties. I pulled them a little bit together as a group so that I didn't have this big column of nothing coming up the center. I brought the birds that were facing the outside edge in a little bit so that they didn't lead you off the page. Um, I got rid of this big dark shadow down here because it's just, it's too visually weighty and it would bring your eye right there, which does mean now because it's a big empty space, I will have to add something texture wise at the end to make it hold a little bit of weight. I want it to have, you know, a little bit of a voice, but I don't want it to shout at you. The other thing I did in the drawing is I eliminated this, oh, I don't know, there are pieces of wood or pieces of the dock or something, but I would call those visual clutter. Um, they add nothing to the design. They add nothing to the concept or the narrative. They're just there. So I'm the artist and I can get rid of them. So once I've got my drawing done, I've got a lot of little marks on here. And they're my own notations to myself and my own nomenclature. Um, there's some places that I have little X's. And to me, when I paint, um, in watercolor, you've got to reserve and protect your whites. And if you don't, you know, there are mechanical ways to retrieve them, but they're never quite as good as if you'd reserve them. So I put those little X's and it tells me, don't put any water and don't put any paint there. Because um, if I do, I won't be able to erase my X's and it'll look like I paint by number. <laughs> so that's my little notation. There are some little X's that I covered with masking fluid because I don't think I can successfully and easily paint around them. And so that's why I've got a little bit of masking fluid. I've got a little bit of masking fluid on the rope as well. And before I start painting, I should talk about what I've done up here design-wise is I'm breaking this into three spaces, this, this, and this. And so, the dock isn't sitting directly in the middle. I've got the dock sitting at an angle, and I've placed it in a way that this space is larger than this space, but every bird's foot gets to stay on the dock because it doesn't make any sense if it doesn't. Um, then I drove, drew the rope after I drew the birds because the rope, I want to further divide that upper space unequally but I don't want it sitting on the very top of any one bird's head because that would be really awkward. It would look like a funny little hat up there. So I drew it according to where the birds landed. And then the masking fluid I put on the rope is just a bunch of little comma shapes so that it will imply rope without having to paint every little single thing. I've also, in, in my drawing, made a distinction between a cast shadow and a shadow on a rounded form. Now, I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is a cast shadow, okay? This light is hitting this. This is casting a shadow because it's blocking the light. So that's a nice hard edge shadow, is a cast shadow. A shadow on a rounded form is gonna sort of transition. It's not gonna have a hard edge. If I made this sunlight shadow on a hard edge, I've made a box, and I want to make a rounded form. So just for myself, because it works in my little head, is when I'm going to attempt a rounded form on a shadow, I put a dotted line. That just tells me, okay, try to diffuse that edge. At this scale, that's going to be a little bit hard to do because it's a small area, but I'm going to aim for it anyway. Um, I've also, and this is not my paint by numbers, but it's so that I don't forget. <laughs> I would not do this on my own painting. I've put some G's, I've put no, I've put some B's. And what that's going to be is bounce light coming into the bellies of these birds. And because the dock I've decided in advance is going to be warm, I'm going to bounce gold into the shadow. And the way you can see that is if this is the shadow under here, look what happens when I bring something gold up into the bottom of the shadow, okay? 
the water, on the other hand, I've decided is going to be quintessential blue Florida Keys water that doesn't really exist that way, but that I would bounce blue into, okay? So I've made myself those notes so that while I'm sitting here being nervous, I won't forget. And I've also made myself another note of a color transition up here that I don't want to forget. So I think I've got all of the all of the um, directions written out. Now all I have to do is follow them. Um, I drew the shadows of the birds in. And normally when I teach and when I paint, I say paint all your shadows first because that sets your design, it sets your form, it sets your light source. The shadows under the birds, I'm going to make an exception to that rule because um, I want... I want them, they have to be there, otherwise I won't get strong light. But if I make them too dark, they're going to be the main focal point of the painting. and They're just a necessary evil. So I'm going to save those particular shadows till the end. But I'm going to start, the easiest for me is to start with this bird, because I'm less likely to run my hand through it. And the colors for my shadows that I typically use are a lizard crimson and phthalo blue and sometimes a little bit of cadmium yellow. Um, the reason I use the alizarin crimson and the phthalo blue is because they stain and they're transparent, which means I can layer over them and I can see through them, which is really helpful if you're going to give a glow. So I'm going to start with a bird up here. Like I say, it's easier for me to not run my hand through it if I don't start here. And I'm not looking for a particular color in the shadow. I'm just looking for something that isn't gray because gray is pretty darn boring. And I'm going to start out by painting my cast shadow. And as I get up over the bird's head, I see a dotted line, so I'm going to try to soften that and um, have it be a little gentler and diffuse out. And like I say, if I was painting one bird and he was this big, that would be really easy. A lot of little birds, you aim for it, but sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. Put another little shadow here. Now, these are white birds. And for a little bit, they're going to look not like white birds. But we'll talk about that later. Um, shadows are generally cool. So they're green, purple, gray, violet, um, blue. But as long as the sunlight area is your local color, the birds should still read as white. So I can get as intense as I want in my shadows, but I have to be real careful not to eliminate my whites. I come down to bird number two, and I've got a G there, which tells me I want gold blended in. And I've got to think about this gold glow, because um, I'm going to make it with a little bit of the um, alizarin crimson and a little bit of my cadmium yellow. If I just use plain yellow, it, it's a little too yellow. It's not, I wouldn't call it gold. I'm going to wet the area. I'm going to drop this little bit of gold in. I've got to think about what I surround that with, because if I surround it with blue, I've got green. If I surround it with a blue-violet, it just pops. It's just going to go gray with a, with a spotlight. So I'm going to surround that with a red-violet which is kind of a safety. And again, I'm just using these same colors. I'm not pulling anything different off my palette. And once I've, I've broadened out from the safety area, I can go into any shadow mixture I want. And 
and I'm coming up here, and I see I have a dotted edge, and I see I have a hard line. So my intention here is to do a little bit of lifting with a thirsty brush. Now it's likely to run back in and be a little harder edge than I had hoped for, but that's mostly due to scale. I'll just coax it around a bit. Up on his head, behind his head, I've got a cast shadow because his head is casting a shadow. But then as that shadow comes up over his head, it's a shadow on a rounded form. So I'm going to soften that edge, or plan to soften that edge. Watercolor is uh, always making you change your plans. <laughs> and you're always correcting mistakes, but that's okay. Sometimes you get happy accidents, yes. So this bird here also has a G, so I'm going to approach it the same way. I'm going to start out with a little diffused gold in the wet area. I'm going to go to my red violet, give it a little protection of red violet, and then continue on with whatever mixture I want to make my shadows. And shadows can be surprisingly colorful, and particularly if you've got a basically white object, you know, to just take like a Payne's gray or some sort of a blue violet, you've lost a real opportunity um, for interest and excitement. So I'd always rather they were a little bit more um, colorful than a little too dull. I've got some dotted lines, so I'm going to try to coax some paint up into there. And I, I'm thinking everybody knows what Thirsty Brush is, but Thirsty Brush is just a <clears throat> dampened, clean brush that I dry a little bit and I can lift with it. It's a gentler lift than I would have if I was doing a paper towel or something. Another one. Same thing, you guys know what I'm doing now. A little bit of gold. A little bit of red violet for protection. And I did not wet these entire birds. If, this was, if these were big birds, I would probably put a lot more water on them. But they're kind of little here. Behind his head is another cast shadow, so I'm going to try to leave that as a hard edge. And then where I want it to come over and end in a soft manner, I'm just going to pull a little water in there and pull it back and hope that it stays back there as it dries. It's like hoping the potato chips don't have any calories, but it doesn't always work that way. Up here, I've got a, blue, a B for blue. I can be a little more forgiving with the blue. Now, I already know I'm going to make the water be predominantly phthalo blue, and it might have a little bit of aqua. And to make an aqua, I'm taking my phthalo blue and mixing a little bit of phthalo green in with it. So that's where a little pre-planning comes in advance. I know what color I'm going to use up here, so I'm going to diffuse it in. I don't have to be so careful with my aqua, okay, because it's already blue-based. So I can surround it with pretty much any violet that I want, and it'll still be fine. But if he's looking a little too much like a bluebird to me, I'll, may, I'll add a little more red in that. And again, I'm just trying to remind myself of 
soft, soft edge, edge, hard edge. edge. But I'm, I'm not going to sweat, sweat bullets, bullets over, over it, it. No, you know, it's, it's just a piece of paper. Over here, I've wrote the word no on the bird. That's because I'm not seeing any of his belly, so I won't see anything bounce up under there. So I can pick whatever shadow um, combinations I want. I'm always going to be a little judicious with the yellow because if I take red, blue, and yellow, I've got gray. And, you know, I probably would prefer the shadows not be too, too gray. So if I use any yellow in there, it's going to be a very minimal amount. Try to soften this edge. I'm going to do it by a combination of adding water and lifting paint. When I come up behind his head, I've got a cast shadow, so I, that, I can, that can have a nice hard edge. And his head blends into his neighbor's head, so I might as well, or his neighbor's back, so I might as well just let it sort of fold itself into there. But I've got to work quickly because I've got a gold right here that I have to get in before this dries. Not the best planning in the world. For that I need my red violet surrounding it. So these bird, two birds at the moment are blending into each other, and that's fine. I can separate them later. For right now, I'm just trying to get all the shadow parts of the bird with a coat of paint on them. Birds, plural. His head's looking a little like a shiny bald spot, so I'm going to try to soften it a bit. Here's a blue, a little over the edge. I'll bounce a little blue into his belly and then continue on with whatever shadow tones I want. I'm painting right through the um, beaks because it really doesn't matter because I know I'm going to put another coat of something a little more opaque over the beaks so I can paint right through them. Soften the edge. All right, now I'm going to have to step to the hair dryer for a moment, which is if there were snacks there, I'd tell you to go have a snack, but they're not, so just don't fall asleep. So this is layer one, okay? This is all the shadows on the birds. Um, I've got a couple of adjustments I need to make before I go on. But when I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm going, oh my gosh, are they going to be white birds? That's going to be my next job, is to make them white birds. Um, but I think they will be. Sometimes when you paint something that's light and airy, like flowers or birds or something, we tend to want to get so accurate that we make them look like they're made out of clay. Okay. I want to keep these birds being light and airy. So I'm being very careful not to look at every single feather here and not to say, oh, well, this one's tilting a little that way. But I do have to do a little bit of separation. So these two birds are blending a little too much into each other. This bird's neck is blending into the back of this bird. This one could use a little separation. So while I'm still working on really light values and white paper and I don't want them to get heavy, I'm just going to do a very gentle and delicate separation. So I'll come up here, separate him from him, just a little bit of paint, 
and then I'll pull a bead of water to try to gentle that. And as long as my reference is white, I'm probably not going to get um, too heavy and, and clumsy with it. If I had all the rest of this painted and then I was doing these separations, I might get a little heavy handed with it. But the fact that I'm doing it on white paper, you know, as my, as my reference, I probably won't get too heavy handed. Fingers crossed. Let's separate this guy a little bit. And I'm not looking at individual feathers. I'm just looking at something that might need to be separated from its neighbor. And the, this has the nice advantage also of being able to give me that third rounded value. These guys are blending into one. So I'm going to put another little coat behind him and in here. And I'm going to have to switch into the red violet because I'm coming up next to my gold. And this should help separate these two birds. And it also, again, acts as that third value to round it. I think I'm going to go ahead and separate these guys a little bit. And you notice I'm not looking at my photograph because my photograph is just a jumping off point. This is what matters. The photograph doesn't. The photograph is just, you know, a little bit of an idea to start with. Okay, so taking a little glance around, I feel like, ooh, I forgot a piece of a neck. How about that? I am actually paying attention. There we go. That would have looked awkward. All right, so I do have to very quickly dry this layer, and then we'll talk about how to make these look like white birds. OK, I've done just enough to separate them a little bit. OK, so now I've got to make them look white. And I'm going to talk just for a second about what you would call relative value. If I took this piece of paper, this here, and I put it up next to black, it looks very white. Okay. If I put it next to something that was actually white, it isn't. Okay. So if I want these birds to look white, I have to do a dock that's dark enough to make them read as white. If I have covered all of the white on the birds, they'll never read as white birds. But as long as I have some sunlit areas that are white, fingers crossed, they're going to look like white birds. So what I come up with for the dock has to be dark enough to make the birds look white. But because you always want to have like three areas of value within a painting, light area, mid-tone area, dark area. I've decided that my water is going to be my dark area. So it has to be, the dock has to be like bigger than a bread box, smaller than an elephant thing. It has to be dark enough that the birds look white, but light enough that the water can be darker. So you're always working in your head with what's the value here. It also has to be warm. Because if I had decided in advance that this was going to be a gray concrete dock, I can't bounce gold up in their bellies because there's nothing to reflect it. So I'm going to make up a version of um, burnt sienna. I could always use burnt sienna from the tube, but then it's the same color from here to here to here to here. And again, like the shadows, that can get a little boring on you. So. I'm going to, since I'm going to make it from the same three colors I've been using, I'm going to start out with my alizarin crimson. And since burnt sienna is warm, I'm going to start out with a warm base. So I'm going to turn that into a red orange because that's already warm. And then I'm going to bring a little bit of my blue into it, which is my neutralizer. 
So it's all three colors, but I've started out warm, so I end up with a warm neutral. It's looking a little bit purple to me, so I'll bring in the complement of purple, which is yellow. And as I mix and mix and mix, eventually I get a big enough pile to do part of it. <laughs> so I'm going to paint it on here dry. I could always do it wet, but then you guys would be sitting on the hair dryer, listening to the hair dryer for a really long time. And I'm not worried that it's uneven because it's going to be a lot more interesting uneven than if I took a can of Sherwin Williams. Um, I'm also not caring if I get backwashes and um, blossoms and things because this is a ratty old deck, so that's okay. When I come up to the birds, I'm going to do what I call is a little bit of a peekaboo edge. And what that means is it touches the birds and it skips back off of the birds. And it's just a pencil thin touching and leaving. And what that does, and you would do the same thing with flowers, is the edges of the feathers pick up a little bit of light. Okay, And it's not a silhouette around it but it gives you the feeling that maybe a feather is curving out in, into the light and maybe another one isn't. And, and it's a really good technique on both feathers and or um, pet, flower petals. So I will here and there touch the birds and then leave the bird. Always have the paper towel. And I'm anticipating getting some blossoms and things in here because I think it would be more interesting. If you absolutely didn't want that, the way to do it is wet, the, wet it all first and then um, you know keep it wet as you're painting. But I think it would be nice to have some of that. Ooh, that's a big pile of paint. Painting right through the legs because, again, I know I'm going to go over them with um, something that's relatively opaque, so there's no point trying to paint around them and making myself crazy. And I'm, I'm sort of initiating some blossoms up in here by going back into paint that's partially dry, but that's okay. I kind of want that. And I'm always keeping in mind that watercolor is going to dry a little bit lighter. And I'm looking at these birds and just making sure in my mind that I think they're going to read as white birds. Hit the edge, leave the edge, hit the edge, leave the edge. Now, if I were doing this as a finished painting that maybe wanted to hang on the wall, I would think about a little texture in this dock, but that's not the case here. You know, I could use salt, I could use spatter. There's a lot of texturizers you can use. Oops, a little more yellow than I want. So if it's a little more yellow, I have to make a little more um, purple in it. So a little red and blue. I will have plenty of paint here. And because I want this dock to vary in color, temperature, and maybe a little bit value-wise, I'm letting it get a little darker towards this side because it makes sense if the sun is coming this way that even though in reality the dock would all be the same color and value, it makes sense to 
let it get a little bit darker as it goes away from the sun. Again, a little bit of a peekaboo edge, kind of hit the edge and leave the edge. All right, I'm going to start this with a hair dryer, and then I'm going to clean my palette and get some clean water because I want to do a cleaner color up top. So while it is sitting here, finishing drying, if anybody wants to take a picture of it, that's a really good time. So as I come back, I'm kind of thinking that I can make these look like white birds. I'm going to let it get a little bit drier before I do the top area. Okay, so there's all these things to think about when you're painting in any medium, not just watercolor. You're thinking about values from light to dark. You're thinking about breakup of space. Um, something else you're thinking about in this piece is neutrals and jewel tones. So this is very neutral. Um, wouldn't it be nice if the water was a jewel tone? So this has to be warm because of bouncing up into the birds. Um, it has to be dark enough in order to make the birds look white. The water has to be my darker value and it, it wants to be jewel tone for me because I think it would be a nice juxtaposition with the, um, the neutral colors on the dock. So that's why I wrote myself this little aqua, blue, and indigo note, because <laughs> once I turn this upside down, it's like trying to drive with your road map upside down, and well, I turn left or turn right. So um, first, I think I'm going to take the masking fluid off of the birds themselves. Um, I always like to take the masking fluid off as soon as I don't think I'm going to need it anymore. I'm not going to take it off the rope for obvious reasons because I haven't painted around it yet. But I think I'm going to get it out of my way on the birds because I, right now to have those blue spots on the birds, I'm finding a little bit distracting when I'm trying to make judgments in my head of, of paint value. Okay. So if I want to shift from aqua to indigo, aqua is going to be phthalo blue and phthalo green. Indigo is going to be phthalo blue and alizarin crimson. So I've got blue and I've got blue. I've got green and I've got red. If I put the two of those together, I'm going to have gray in the center because I'm going to have red and green. I don't want that. So I have to have, just like I had a little buffer, around the birds, I have to have a little transition area here in the water also. So if blue is the common color in both indigo and aqua, I need a band of blue to transition it. All right. Um, I'm going to do it wet and wet because I don't want it to be a, a stripe of aqua, a stripe of blue, a stripe of indigo. So that's why I needed clean water. And, whoops, a clean brush would help too, wouldn't it? <laughs> a clean, clean water is kind of moot if your brush is all dirty. Um, I'm not going to try to write wet right exactly up to the profiles of the birds because I, with clean water, honestly, I can't see it. And I'm just going to push the paint into the profiles. But I need enough fluidity that the paint's going to flow for me.
And if I were doing this as a finished painting, you wouldn't see those words indigo, blue, aqua, and peekaboo edges written up there. Okay. <laughs> They're just so that I don't forget to tell you and that I don't get lost. So the aqua, phthalo green, which is a beautiful, beautiful, intense green, um, does not make leaves without being neutralized, but it's really good for aqua water, with a little bit of phthalo blue. And I've got this color that we all think that the water in the Keys is, even though it's not. And I want to keep in mind, this is wet. I want it to end up darker than my dock. So I've got to really saturate that paint. I can't be um, timid with the amount of pigment I put in. I'm going to be fairly careful around the edge of the birds because this is where I set their profile. Sounds like they're having a party out there. <laughs> you know, I'm going to start transitioning this into blue by just taking this nice big puddle I've got and bringing more blue pigment into it. So it's going to become sort of a gentle transition. I'm not making a whole new pile of paint. I'm just adjusting that big pile. If this starts to dry too much, I can always diffuse a little more water into it. Come out on this side and try to be pretty pure blue without any of the green in it. I've still got a little green up here, so I'm avoiding that area of my puddle. And now I can start blending a little bit of the alizarin crimson into this end and starting to turn it into indigo. And then I want to end up this band of color really strong and intense because I'd like to have a little bit of drama in this because that drama is going to make these birds glow. Otherwise, they're just Florida pigeons. So I'm not going to be sparing with the paint. I'm putting it into the wet ground so it's going to diffuse and soften some, but... If I had looked at these birds with the dock and they weren't starting to look white to me, before I did this, I would have needed to put another coat on the dock and then I would have had to make sure that this, the water was really dark. I'm going to roll this a little bit. And what I'm trying to do is get these colors to blend a little more gently through here, but I'm going to have a paper towel in my hand because if it starts to run into one of the bird's heads, I've got to mop it up real quick. It probably won't because they're dry, but that doesn't mean it can't. Okay. 
And if you're rolling something like this and you start to get blossoms and backwashes, it means it's too dry to roll because the blossoms and backwashes are uneven pigment or uneven, not pigment, uneven wetness. And so if this is starting to dry a little bit and I roll wet pigment into it, um, I'm going to get blossoms. I'm just going to make sure that the bottom is good and dry so that I can do the shadows. Okay, for me, the hardest part of this is these shadows under here because they have to be a value that is going to be plausible for strong sunlight, but you don't want them to draw undue attention to them themselves. So I think I'm going to make a red violet because that will layer nicely over the burnt sienna. And I'm going to keep my fingers crossed and hope that I'm coming up with a good value. I'm going to paint it on, paint it on um, dry paper because I have a little better sense of what the value is going to be than if I wet it first because as things dry, they, get, um, they change value. So in my mind, if this looks to be sort of that value, when it's wet, it'll dry okay. I can always darken them. If they come out too dark, you know, if they're too contrasty, then I've got to darken the dock. If I darken the dock, I've got to do this and darken the water. And that's kind of like, you know, cutting off one side of your hair and then the other side of your hair. And then pretty soon there's no hair left. I didn't forget anybody's shadow. I think everybody who needs a shadow has a shadow. I'm seeing a little tiny detail that is bothering me a little bit, and that's this is a big blank area. So I'm going to take a little bit of that dirty burnt sienna y color I had, and I'm going to protect these birds, and I'm just going to put a little tiny bit of spatter over there where I took the... Um, I took that big cast shadow off, but I'm, now I'm left with too big of a blank area. And if I wanted to, I could very carefully do a little bit of that around the birds too. I do have to dry it, but it'll be a quick dry, I promise. Okay, so as I was drying it, I was making a quick visual assessment of the values, and I'm okay with the values. Um, if I'm not, I don't take this, the masking fluid off my rope yet. Because if I have to adjust this, I have to adjust this, then I have to adjust that, and I don't want to have to paint around where all those little whites were. So I'm going to call it good enough, and I'm going to take up the masking fluid. And I've got these little floating pieces of confetti that are supposed to be rope. And that's real easy to deal with. I just take essentially dirty water or dirty palette and I make little gentle loops along the bottom of it. And that just turns it into a rope with sunlight on it and it quiets it down a little bit because I, I want it as an accent. I don't want it as real subject matter. And dirty water is real good for that. And dirty palette. Okay, so all the hard work is done and I get to have fun, which is to put the legs and the beaks and the eyeballs on. And I'm going to switch to my cadmium red, which I rarely use, but 
I mostly work in transparent paints. Um, cadmium red is opaque. What the fact that it's an opaque paint means it will also wash off if I tend, wanted to paint over it. Your, your um, transparent colors tend to stain more. So there's no point in putting legs and beaks on until I'm real sure that everything else is where I want it value-wise because it'll just wash away. But if I put a transparent paint over top, I'll be seeing all of this through the birds, uh, I mean, you know, through the paint, and it will look like I have transparent birds. So this is a case where I would head into a, an opaque watercolor. I would paint right through the eyes, and someone who is a bird enthusiast is going to tell me that they have little white areas around their eyeballs, but I'm not going to worry about that because the Audubon Society is down somewhere else today. They're not coming here. I'll paint the legs. And this is like, you know, I will always say, bake your cake, ice your cake, decorate your cake. This is the little happy birthday stuff going on. This isn't the cake or the icing. This is the decoration. So you don't get to put this on until you've got a foundation under it. I also tend to use a, a rigger to do stuff like this because I can't really control it. And when we start to put details on too exact, we start to look less confident as artists and start to look a little fussy. The birds are getting whiter, yes, yes. And that's your relative value. And the other thing that's happening is because the birds had a lot of this sort of jewel tone colors in them, they looked a little jewel tone. But once I went ahead and put the red in, relatively speaking, it quiets down the color transitions that's in, that are within them. They're so bright. They should still have a little glow, but now I've got something in here that's brighter than that. And, you know, no matter what you're painting, you always want to be thinking about those things. You know. Otherwise, you're just sort of imitating a photograph, and if it's a bad photograph, then it's a bad painting, and you wonder why. You know, you're always designing. I like this guy because he's got his mouth open. And I like to have one of an object sometimes that's just a little out of kilter. I also adjusted beaks when I drew them so that none of them came at a really awkward stopping point. Okay, they need little black eyes. And the black that I make is just my phthalo green that went into this and my alizarin crimson, they're both a nice, rich, um, complementary colors. So you mix them together, they make a beautiful black. Again, on the, um, on the end of the rigger brush, so I, don't, I can't bet, get too exact. Just give us a couple little dot, dotted eyes. Okay. We're going to call it done. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome.